According to psychologists, most often teenagers commit offenses for three reasons. The desire to assert themselves and gain authority among their peers, alcohol addiction or addiction to illegal drugs, but most importantly, a sense of impunity. Even for the most serious crimes, minors often receive minimal punishment because their young age is taken into account. In our story today, a schoolgirl named Mackenzie Sharilla became the perpetrator of a terrible tragedy that took two lives at once. However, the girl herself did not feel remorse for her crime, and at the trial stated that she could do almost anything while staying alive, but she does not consider herself cool. Mackenzie repeatedly changed her testimony, writing off everything on a lapse in memory, and apparently, until the last moment was confident that she would get away with it. But the verdict of the judge literally dumbfounded the young criminal and her mother, so desperately defending her daughter. But let's get to the bottom of this. Who is Mackenzie Sharilla? Mackenzie Sharilla was born in August 2004 in the quiet town of Strongsville, Ohio, and was the third child in the family. Her parents, John Sharilla and Natalie Stevens, tried to bring up their heirs in love and care to give them a good education and encourage all endeavors. The youngest daughter was a family favorite. She was forgiven many pranks from childhood, and even serious misdemeanors often got away with it. Mackenzie grew up capricious, demanding, and selfish girl. She was used to the fact that parents always do as she requires, and was also confident in her own impunity no matter what she did. Classmates and teachers of the girl noted that in childhood she was quite a nice and open child, but with age, her character and behavior began to deteriorate. The girl threw real tantrums. If something went wrong, she easily lost her temper, behaved impudently and impatiently, swore and could even get into a fight. Mackenzie did not consider anyone's opinion but her own. Her word should always be the last, and she put her own interests above all else. In adolescence, the character of the girl became simply unbearable, but her parents did not see anything terrible in this. Believing that her daughter has a transitional age, and she should be treated with understanding and patience. However, bad character was far from the worst of all the troubles. In high school, Mackenzie was addicted to alcohol, as well as sometimes dabbled in illegal drugs, but she got away with it. Often the girl's actions were reckless and carried a direct threat not only to her, but also to the people around her. Parents still did not notice, or simply did not want to notice the obvious problem. Like many of her peers, Mackenzie was a big fan of social media and literally never let her smartphone out of her hands. She often posted provocative pictures of herself smoking or drinking alcohol on her account, and she left equally provocative comments on them. Mackenzie's friends were just like her. Together they vandalized, organized pogroms, fights, sometimes stole, and several times came to the attention of the police. However, the young people were treated only with warnings and educational talks which strengthened their belief in their own impunity. Dominique Rousseau, a young man named Dominic Rousseau, was also a native of Strongsville. He was born in September 2001 and was the fourth of seven children to his parents, Frank and Christine Rousseau. The boy was raised with three brothers and three sisters, with whom he was always very close. Dominic studied well in school, from childhood years actively engaged in sports, and tried to lead a healthy lifestyle. Despite the fact that he grew up in a large family, neither he himself nor any of his brothers or sisters was not deprived of parental love, attention, and care. Spouses Frank and Christine were moderately strict with their children, but at the same time promoted their all-round development. Dominic always had a lot of friends. He was used to being in the center of attention and became the soul of any company. The young man had a bright and quite attractive appearance, was trim and interesting, so he also had a lot of admirers from a young age. However, he himself tried to avoid fleeting romances, emphasizing serious and promising relationships. After graduating from high school, Russo became a student at a local university, choosing the specialization producer of performing arts. He dreamed of linking his life with music and one day becoming a famous music producer. In addition, the talented and versatile Dominic wrote and performed songs himself, by the age of 20, the guy already had his own small business. He bought a car and rented a separate apartment in a good neighborhood. At the same time, he continued to play sports and was considered one of the best students at the university. First love. 
Dominic and Mackenzie met for the first time when the girl studied in the graduating class. It happened at one of the parties in the company of mutual friends, and this accidental meeting became fatal for both of them. Young people were complete opposites of each other, and opposites are known to attract. A handsome, curly-haired young man, well-versed in music, immediately attracted Mackenzie's attention. He was radically different from the guys she usually socialized with. He was educated, well-mannered, interesting, and could easily hold a conversation on any topic. Mackenzie herself had a striking appearance and slim figure, dressed well, and knew how to make the right impression. She turned on all her charm to draw the attention of the guy she liked, and she managed to achieve the desired rather quickly. In the fall of 2021, the couple began dating, and almost immediately each of them introduced the chosen one to their parents. But if Mackenzie's parents were delighted with her choice and considered Dominic a brilliant couple for their daughter, the parents of the guy had mixed feelings about his passport. On the one hand, the girl looked sweet, innocent, and tried to make a good impression on them. But on the other hand, something in her immediately alerted Frank and Christine Russo. Friends and family members of Cheryl were sure that Mackenzie, for the first time in her life, really fell in love and sincerely hoped that the relationship with the Chosen One will positively affect her character and behavior. Then no one could not even guess what tragedy would end this youthful romance. The couple began to appear everywhere together, holding hands and openly demonstrating their tender feelings for each other. So soon, the whole small town knew about the relationship. Those who knew Mackenzie well sincerely felt sorry for her boyfriend, but most just happy for them. What was wrong with her? Soon Dominic began to notice oddities in his girlfriend's behavior, her defiant antics and desire to make everyone around her do only what she wants. At first he did not focus too much attention on it, writing off everything on the young age and the desire to attract attention. The young people made plans for their future together, and even planned to get married as soon as Mackenzie turned 18. They also planned to leave their native provincial town and together go to conquer a major metropolis, ideally, New York. There before Dominic would open a lot of opportunities to build a brilliant career in the music industry and fully reveal his talent. But as time went on, Mackenzie's behavior became more and more alarming and sometimes even frightened the guy. She demanded from her boyfriend that he did only what she wanted, and if he did not agree with her in something, she made scandals, threw tantrums, and behaved like a little capricious child. At first Dominic tried to translate everything into a joke, but soon realized that this is the true face of his chosen one. In public she was still trying to hold on, but being alone with her boyfriend spewed on him the whole storm of his emotions, and sometimes even pounced on him with fists. Mackenzie's behavior became more and more aggressive, and at some point, the young man decided that he had enough. He suggested that she take a pause in the relationship and sort out her feelings. But upon hearing this, Mackenzie had a public showdown in front of their mutual friends. She screamed, threatened Dominic that she would kill him if he left her, threatened to burn down his house and wreck his car. But by doing so, she only made him feel more confident that he was doing the right thing by ending this toxic and unrewarding relationship. Obsessive stalking. Mackenzie had no intention of letting her boyfriend go, and at first she acted as if nothing had happened. She continued to call him, called him to various parties and other events, as well as exhibited in social networks of their joint photos, accompanying them with posts, with declarations of love. When Dominic firmly told her that everything is over between them, she literally went mad with anger and rage. Mackenzie went to his house almost daily and shouted all sorts of nasty things, insults and threats under his windows. She called him from different numbers, left messages on his answering machine, wrote on social media and emailed him. Mackenzie then swore in love and offered to try to start all over again, then again began to insult and threats. Russo was confused. He simply did not know how to react to such behavior because he had never encountered such behavior. He tried talking, tried to ignore the former lover, and a couple of times even recorded her threatening tantrums on his phone. It got to the point that Sharilla, seeing the ex-boyfriend on the street or in another public place, began to scream and insult him in front of passersby. She turned Dominic's life into a real nightmare, but he still hoped that a little more time would pass and she would leave him alone 
switching to someone else. One day, in front of witnesses, Mackenzie declared that it was easier for her to kill Dominic than to let him go. Mackenzie said that if he didn't come back to her, no one would have him, and she would take care of it. The young man did not take these words seriously, although those around him realized that Mackenzie was not joking. Among the most frequent threats from the mouth of the schoolgirl were promises to hit and run over the guy with a car, as well as to put him in the car and drive off a cliff or stop on the railroad in front of a train rushing at them. Each option sounded terrifying, and each of them Mackenzie described in detail, as if she had planned it all out long ago and was just waiting for the right moment. An unexpected reconciliation. When Mackenzie realized that threats and insults would not help her to get Dominic back, but only distanced him, she decided to change her tactics. Mackenzie became sweet and charming again, stopped pressuring and harassing her ex-boyfriend, and instead tried her best to pretend that she realized her mistakes and wanted to change for the better. She talked about the upcoming enrollment, asked to help her choose a university, and also claimed that she had gotten smart and most of all was now concerned about the final exams. Such changes pleasantly surprised Dominic. He, in spite of everything, still had tender feelings for the former girlfriend and decided out of kindness to help her with university enrollment. Therefore, they again began to see each other and communicate. Gradually, the couple became close again. Dominic began to invite Mackenzie on dates, sought to spend all his free time with her, and believed that she had changed, matured, became more serious and responsible. He did not notice how he fell in love with her again, and all the former offenses remained somewhere in the past. However, this time the young people were in no hurry to announce to all friends and acquaintances about their reunion. Their meetings were more like secret dates, where they just enjoyed each other's company, avoiding the close attention of others. When Dominic's own brother Angelo learned about what was happening, he suggested that nothing good would come of it. But the young man in love did not heed his words. A devious plan. While Dominic naively rejoiced at being reunited with his girlfriend and the changes he thought had happened to her, Mackenzie herself hatched a terrifying plan of reprisal against the young man. She was so fascinated by the idea of a car and a spectacular car crash that she began to work out this scenario in detail. In her free time, she spent hours driving around the city, choosing a place suitable for the realization of her plan. However, there were no high and steep cliffs nearby, and going out on the tracks while waiting for a train seemed to her an unreliable idea. One day, Sharilla drove into a nearby industrial area, a fairly secluded place with no cameras on the way, and very few cars in the area. The schoolgirl's attention was drawn to a huge brick wall, and her sick imagination immediately conjured up a new, no less horrible plan. She decided that if she accelerated to the maximum possible speed and crashed into the wall, it would be no less spectacular than falling off a cliff into an abyss. It should be noted that initially Mackenzie planned to die together with her lover, so that their story was retold by all the inhabitants of the city. She even told her best friend about it, but her friends simply did not believe in the seriousness of her intentions, because Mackenzie had visited such delusional ideas before, but everything was limited to empty conversations. A terrible realization of the plan and an accidental victim. At the end of July 2022, just a week before her coming of age, Mackenzie suggested to Dominic that they go to an upcoming party hosted by their mutual friends. It would be a good opportunity to have fun, to unwind and to let everyone know that they were back together and loved each other dearly. The young man readily agreed. He still didn't feel threatened by Mackenzie and believed in the sincerity of her feelings and intentions. The event was scheduled for Saturday, July 30th. Dominique and Mackenzie appeared in the middle of the party, holding hands, which immediately attracted the attention of those present. They looked happy, smiled, and openly showed affectionate feelings for each other. Friends were sincerely pleased with their reunion and noted that they are a very beautiful and harmonious couple. All evening and all night the young people had fun, willingly photographed and without shyness, kissed in front of everyone. But no one even guessed what a terrible tragedy would end this party. The couple drank a little, however, like everyone else at the event. But Mackenzie, secretly from everyone, took a dose of illegal drugs, so to speak, for courage 
so as not to change his mind, and at the last moment did not hit the brakes. In the morning, Russo and Cirilla said goodbye to everyone and headed for the car, but then a friend of the guy, Davian Flanagan, followed them and asked them to give him a ride home. Mackenzie tried to object, saying they had plans of their own, but Dominic saw no problem with giving his friend a ride. Not wanting to fight, arouse suspicion, or change plans, Mackenzie agreed, signing Davian's death warrant. Despite her lover's objections, Mackenzie got behind the wheel of the car. Her boyfriend sat next to her in the passenger seat, and her friend sat behind him. The car started and slowly pulled away from the party venue, heading out on its most recent trip. On the main street, Mackenzie drove quietly, keeping to the speed limit and trying not to draw attention to herself. At a stoplight, she stopped, though the road was empty. Mackenzie once again considered her plan while her passengers dozed off. She later claimed that she wanted to die in the accident, but the perpetrator was obviously lying because she had fastened her seatbelt during the last stop while her passengers remained unbuckled. When the light turned green, she drove off, quickly picking up speed, and then took a sharp turn onto a poorly lit secondary road leading into an industrial area. Obviously, the guys didn't immediately realize what was going on. If at all, it was as if the devil himself had possessed the driver. The car accelerated to top speed, but Mackenzie continued to press hard on the gas pedal, steering the car into a blank brick wall. A bystander and a miraculous rescue. There wasn't a soul in the industrial area early Sunday morning, so no one saw the accident or rushed to help. Only one woman who lived on the outskirts, not far from the scene of the accident, heard the bang and was not too lazy to go outside to see what was the matter. She saw smoke, and when she got closer, she realized that there had been a car crash, after which she ran back inside to call emergency services. Medics arrived at the scene about half an hour after the accident, but the two guys in the car could not be helped. They died on the spot. The girl behind the wheel was alive. She was saved by her seatbelt and airbags. Mackenzie was unconscious, and her legs were trapped in the mangled car, but she was breathing, and her pulse was clearly palpable, giving hope that she would survive. She opened her eyes several times during the process of being released from the car, but was obviously unaware of what was going on around her. Mackenzie was immediately sent to the hospital where she was diagnosed with a number of fractures and internal organ damage. Blood tests showed that she was under the influence of alcohol and drugs. However, According to the doctor, perhaps that is what prevented her from dying from painful shock while help was on the way. Investigation, Leads, and Confession Initially, the police, having received the results of Mackenzie's tests, assumed that she, being under the influence of illegal substances, simply did not realize what she was doing and perhaps tried to drive through the wall or did not see any obstacles in her way. In favor of this version was the lack of braking distance. It was not possible to talk to Shirilla herself because she was unconscious in the intensive care unit after a complex operation. However, she soon came to her senses and realizing what she had done, began to sob and pour out her soul to the doctor on duty. She admitted that she purposely drove into the wall at a great speed because she wanted to kill her boyfriend and originally planned to die with him. Mackenzie also added that Davian was an accidental victim due to his own obsession because he asked to go with them. The doctor did not take the patient's rambling story seriously, deciding that it was a delusional state resulting from anesthesia and painkillers as well as guilt over the death of a loved one. And when the police were allowed to talk to the recovering Mackenzie, she suddenly changed her testimony completely. Now Mackenzie claimed that she remembered almost nothing about the events of that night because she took alcohol and illegal substances. According to the girl, she had a lapse in memory after she got behind the wheel, and how Davian was in the car, she has no idea. However, the facts were to the contrary. The surveillance cameras were able to track the first part of the route the car had taken, and the footage clearly showed that Mackenzie was driving slowly and according to the rules until she suddenly turned onto a road leading to an industrial zone. Moreover, it turned out that Mackenzie had driven the entire route both ways several days earlier, and her car had been seen there at various times by at least a dozen witnesses. Back to normal. After being discharged from the hospital, Mackenzie recovered quickly enough and tried to get back to her old, carefree life. 
She had no remorse and was confident that she could get away with it. Mackenzie was once again active on social media, meeting with friends and making plans for the future. In September, she decided to go to a concert of her favorite band playing in a neighboring city. At that time, the bones of her legs had not yet fully fused, but this did not stop her, and she appeared on the concert stage in a wheelchair. At the same time, she wore bright makeup, dressed provocatively, took selfies with friends, and posted them on her account. In October, when Shirilla was on her feet, she went to a Halloween celebration dressed up in a pre-made costume. Mackenzie lived life to the fullest and even made new acquaintances, but on November 4th, 2022, she was taken into custody. Trial and sentencing. It took the investigation just over three months to gather the necessary evidence and proof to bring the case to trial. Mackenzie was charged with premeditated aggravated double murder and possession and use of a controlled substance that was found in her pocket and detected in her blood. The defendant changed her testimony several times, first citing a lapse in memory, and then, when her friend testified in court as a witness to whom she revealed her plan, Mackenzie changed tactics, saying that she wanted to die with her lover. But even here there were immediately discovered inconsistencies because she had previously fastened herself with a seatbelt. On August 21, 2023, Shirilla was found guilty of all charges. However, an important nuance was taken into account, namely, at the time of the crime, she was not yet 18 years old. It was five days before her majority, so she was tried as a minor. Under state law, she was entitled to at least two consecutive sentences of 15 years for each murder, without parole. But because of her young age, she was allowed to serve the two sentences concurrently, meaning she would be eligible for parole in 15 years. By then, Mackenzie would be 33 years old. Both sides were unhappy with the court's decision. Family members of the deceased young people said they would seek a review of the case in order to increase the punishment, and parents and Mackenzie's lawyer, on the contrary, considered the sentence too harsh and filed an appeal. However, the judge left the sentence unchanged, noting that he did not believe that Shirilla would leave prison after 15 years. The defendant herself, in his opinion, did not repent for the evil she had committed, behaved arrogantly and even insolently towards the court. But now she will have enough time to seriously consider her heinous act. The case of Philip Granda. What drove the former pastor to end the life of his pregnant wife? Some individuals only feign kindness, friendliness, and responsiveness, but deep down, they lack love, compassion, or even pity for those closest to them. It's often hard if at all possible, to explain why a person might decide on a crime so severe, leading to the act being attributed to poor genetics or inherent or acquired defects. But what could push a former clergyman and nurse to end the life of his own pregnant wife? The case of Philip Grandin in 2011 shocked all of Canada and received widespread international media attention. The former Baptist church pastor and qualified medical professional, who was working at a nursing home at the time, was accused of the ruthless crime against his wife, Carissa Grandin, who was 20 weeks pregnant. The investigation of this complex case dragged on for over a decade, and the final judgment of the court left the deceased woman's relatives dissatisfied. Carissa and Philip Grandin, before they met Carissa Amma Grandin, May Darwin, was born on October 10, 1981, in Asai City in the capital region of the Philippines and was the eldest of two daughters in the simple family of Maria and Marvin Darwin. She was raised alongside her sister, Joanna. When she was 13, her parents, seeking a better life, took their daughters and immigrated to Canada. The family settled in Toronto, where the children went to school and the parents found work and joined a local religious community. All family members were congregants of the Baptist Church. Carissa was an excellent student at school and later enrolled at a university, choosing to study archaeology and geology while also working part-time at a hardware store. In 2006, Darwin graduated with honors from university, earning a master's degree, and began working at a local geological research institute. Friends and colleagues described her as kind, attentive, and very responsive, always ready to lend a helping hand. 
She was deeply religious and regularly attended church, where she eventually met her future husband. Philip Grandin was born on August 18, 1986 in Paris, but moved to Toronto, Canada with his parents as a child. His parents were also religious and were congregants of the Baptist Church, raising their son in strict adherence and obedience. At school, young Philip was active and ambitious, but very sensitive and trusting. He excelled academically, consistently participated in various school project competitions and scientific practical conferences, but had practically no friends, as his peers considered him a nerd and dull. Grandin received a scholarship in his senior years and graduated from school as the top student in the Ontario district. He could have built a brilliant career in science, but his parents insisted that he attend a theological seminary. After graduating successfully, he became a pastor at one of the Baptist churches in Toronto, where he met Carissa. Religious Spouses The charming congregant was five years older than the young pastor, but the pair immediately felt a mutual affection. Their relationship began with friendly interactions, but gradually the young couple grew closer and fell in love. As devout individuals with strict and conservative views, they could not live together without being married. Therefore, Philip and Carissa married just a few months after meeting. The couple held a wedding that adhered to all religious traditions, attended not only by close friends and family, but also by fellow congregants of the Baptist Church. After their marriage, the spouses settled in Scarborough, an inviting area in the eastern part of Toronto, close to Lake Ontario. At first glance, the couple seemed perfectly matched. Both were young, intelligent, ambitious, and shared similar life perspectives and unshakable faith in God. They believed that spiritual closeness and sincere love were the main components of marital bliss, the first few years of their life together were peaceful and harmonious. The long-awaited miracle and a terrible secret. Let's start with the fact that Carissa, due to an illness in her youth that caused a serious inflammatory condition, had been unable to conceive for a long time. She chose not to disclose her condition, so only her family and husband knew about it. For several years, she unsuccessfully visited doctors, underwent examinations, took treatment courses, and agreed to experimental therapies, but to no avail. Doctors were at a loss and even suggested that she might never be able to become a mother. In 2011, after four years of marriage, she finally became pregnant. When the test results came back positive, she couldn't believe her luck and hurried to share the happy news with her husband. However, Philip received the news with restraint and even indifference. Clarissa didn't pay much attention to this initially, believing her husband just needed time to adjust to the reality that they would soon be parents and their life would change. However, in August 2011, shortly after confirming her pregnancy, she discovered a secret her husband had been keeping for many months. As it turned out, the pastor had started an affair with one of the young congregants, Elaine Florentino, who was also a close friend of his wife. When Carissa heard rumors of the infidelity, she initially refused to believe them, but then decided to check Philip's laptop and found messages confirming his affair with his mistress. Furthermore, by checking his browsing history, she saw that her spouse regularly visited adult sites and preferred quite perverse videos. That same day, she confronted her husband, noting that she was willing to forgive him and her friend to preserve their family. However, she demanded that he immediately end things with Elaine and stop visiting depraved websites. Another condition was his agreement to undergo couples therapy. Philip accepted all conditions, promising to return to the righteous path to save their marriage. Clarissa sought help from their mutual friend and pastor named Stephen, whom she trusted completely. He listened attentively to her and agreed to help them as a family therapist. However, during a personal conversation with Philip, he strongly recommended that he leave the church service, as his actions and behavior were unworthy of a clergyman. Grandin was infuriated by these words, but, fearing public scandal, agreed to resign his pastoral duties. New job, old vices. Philip completed his training 
becoming a qualified nurse, and soon received several attractive job offers. He chose a local nursing home, located about 20 minutes from his own home, which offered a respectable salary, and this option seemed suitable to him. It seemed that life was gradually improving, and both family therapy and the job change were beneficial for him. He tried to be an exemplary family man, assuring that he had stopped watching adult films, ended his affair, and was faithful to his wife alone. In reality, however, he continued to meet secretly with Elaine, but did so very cautiously, trying not to be seen by anyone. The couple even avoided hotels and motels, and their meetings took place in Philip's car, where they drove to secluded areas. Soon Carissa suspected that her husband was still seeing his mistress, and secretly checked his phone, where she found messages with Florentino. During a family therapy session, she declared that she knew everything, detailing what she had found in his phone. Stephen was displeased with this turn of events, and Philip was seething with anger, although he tried to hide it. At home, he caused a scene, stating that such things could have been said to him personally, rather than in the presence of a third party, to which his wife responded that making the problem public was the only way to influence him in any way. Strange Symptoms about a week after Carissa admitted she knew about her husband's infidelity, she suddenly felt unwell. On October 14th, her condition deteriorated so much that she was forced to seek medical help. She was hospitalized with complaints of severe weakness, dizziness, drowsiness, and disorientation. She lost consciousness twice, her blood pressure dropped to dangerous levels, and doctors were seriously concerned for the life and health of the expectant mother and her baby. However, all these symptoms were quite strange, as Mrs. Groundan had previously had no such issues. Clarissa confessed that she felt unwell in the morning after drinking a smoothie prepared by her husband, but at the time, she did not think much of it. However, in the evening, after drinking a herbal tea Philip made, she felt much worse. She asked whether her husband had added any medications to the drink, but he assured her that he had not. The patient's condition and her story raised many questions, and the doctor examining her decided to immediately perform a toxicological blood test. The results showed traces of a drug called lorazepam, which has sedative, sleep-inducing, anti-convulsive, and muscle-relaxant properties, and also significantly slows down the central nervous system. According to the tests, the woman had ingested a large dose of this drug, but she insisted she didn't even know what the medication looked like. Grandin was hospitalized for 24 hours to stabilize her condition, but strangely, her husband was not questioned in connection with the incident. The occurrence was dismissed as a bizarre accident. However, Carissa herself did not think so, and in a phone conversation with her sister, she confessed that she believed Philip might have been trying to poison her or eliminate their unborn child. Mysterious Demise of a Pregnant Wife On October 15th, Carissa was discharged from the hospital, but two days later, she tragically died in her own bathroom under bizarre circumstances. At around 10 in the evening on October 17th, a distraught Philip called emergency services, pleading for them to come quickly to aid his pregnant wife. According to Philip, he had gone for a jog, and upon returning, found his wife unconscious in a full bathtub, suspecting that she might have drowned. While waiting for the ambulance, the dispatcher instructed him on how to administer first aid and perform resuscitation. However, Philip claimed unfamiliarity with CPR and chest compressions, which was odd for someone with his medical training as a nurse. Moreover, he stated that he couldn't lift his wife out of the tub because she was too heavy and her body was wet and slippery. The dispatcher then advised him to first drain the bathtub, place a towel under her head, and then use a sheet under her arms to lift her out. Only splashing sounds were heard over the phone, and a few minutes later, Philip reported that he was unable to lift her. When the medical team arrived at the Grandin home, they were surprised to find that he hadn't even removed the bathtub plug to drain the water, and all this time, Carissa's head had remained submerged. Philip seemed to be in a state of shock, 
barely comprehending what was happening, merely pleading for them to save Carissa and repeating that they were about to have a baby. Unfortunately, it was too late to save the young woman, and she died before the doctors could assist her, along with her unborn child. At the time of her tragic death, Mrs. Grandin was 20 weeks pregnant. An autopsy revealed that the cause of death was drowning as her lungs were filled with water. However, the toxicology report yielded an unexpected result. It turned out that Carissa's blood contained a high dose of lorazepam, the same medication detected in her system a few days earlier when she was hospitalized feeling unwell. Additionally, a small hematoma was found on the back of her head incurred just before her death. The injury wasn't severe, and most likely, she had hit her head on the edge of the bathtub. The Mistress at the Wife's Funeral On the day of Carissa's demise, her husband Philip was taken to the station and questioned. Despite some oddities, the tragedy was chopped up to a freak accident, and Philip was released as there were no charges to press against him. The following day, Philip, along with Carissa's relatives, began organizing the funeral. When offered to purchase a double plot at the cemetery, he reacted sharply, stating he planned to remarry and start a new family in the future, so he did not intend to reserve a place next to Carissa. His behavior appeared very strange, given that he had just lost his pregnant wife and was already talking about remarrying. Moreover, he did not seem like a grieving widower, but rather seemed to be planning his life ahead, as if he was pleased about his newfound freedom. After all necessary examinations, Clarissa's body was released to her family for a farewell ceremony held at the Baptist church she had attended. Dozens of people attended to honor the memory of Carissa, who had passed away prematurely. However, the ceremony was unexpectedly disrupted by the appearance of Elaine, causing anger and sincere indignation among those aware of her relationship with the widowed former pastor. Philip observed the proceedings from a distance and made no attempt to ease the situation. After the funeral, he secretly went to mourn at his mistress's home. Investigation and Irrefutable Evidence Following his wife's death, Philip went back to living his usual life, not even attempting to feign grief. He was openly dating his mistress, and his behavior fueled numerous rumors and local disapproval. Over several months, Carissa's parents and sister repeatedly contacted the police, seeking to initiate further investigation into why a pregnant 29-year-old woman died under such strange circumstances. Law enforcement was inactive for a long time until the Darwin family decided to go public with the case and spoke to the press. Only under public pressure did a new investigation begin. In May 2012, Philip was arrested on suspicion of deliberately ending the life of his pregnant wife. He was accused of administering a large dose of lorazepam to her, and after she became incapacitated, placing her in a bathtub where she drowned. Allegedly, it was during this time she hit her head on the bathtub edge. All the evidence against Philip was circumstantial, and a few days later, he was released on bail pending the investigation. He had previously claimed that the incident was an accident, but later suggested that his wife might have voluntarily ended her life. No traces of Laura Zapam were found in the ground and home, and the drug was prescription only, which neither spouse had obtained. The doctors who had cared for Carissa during her pregnancy confirmed they had not prescribed any potent medications as they could harm the baby. Philip did have access to lorazepam at work, where he was in charge of administering it to some patients. But could he have stolen some of the drug to harm his own wife? The suspicions were plausible, but there was no direct evidence. During the investigation, Philip's personal laptop was seized, which revealed intriguing information. Shortly before Carissa was hospitalized with complaints of feeling unwell, her husband had searched online to find out what dose of lorazepam could be fatal. And as we remember, this drug was indeed found in her system. Furthermore, on the night his wife was in the hospital, Philip had used a website to call a woman to his home to provide intimate services for money. He also maintained daily communication with Elaine, exchanging messages and phone calls. 
Lastly, it was hard to believe that a strong adult man could not pull his petite wife out of the bathtub and did not even bother to remove the plug, leaving her body submerged in water headfirst. First, trial and sentence. The trial of Philip began only in February 2014, nearly two and a half years after Carissa's death. The defendant was charged with first-degree murder, and Joanna Darwin insisted that her sister had suspected her husband of trying to poison her, as she had confided in a phone conversation the day before she died. The prosecution argued that Philip had premeditated his wife's murder, with the incident occurring a few days prior to the tragedy serving as a kind of rehearsal. He had been calculating the correct dosage of the drug, as evidenced by his internet searches, after which he intoxicated Carissa and drowned her while she was helpless in the bathtub. Philip, however, now insisted that his wife had ended her own life and that he was simply too late to save her. However, the deceased's relatives firmly denied the possibility of suicide noting that Carissa was a deeply religious person who would never commit such a grave sin, especially harming her long-awaited child. Witness testimonies, autopsy, and toxicological reports, as well as the search history on the defendant's laptop, pointed to his guilt. Thus, in January 2015, Philip Grandin was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to 15 years in prison without the possibility of parole new trials, and a surprising decision. Immediately after the sentencing, the former pastor and his lawyer filed several appeals challenging the court's decision. The defense argued that the evidence presented by the prosecution was circumstantial, and the Supreme Court ordered a new trial. Phillips' defenders suggested that his marriage was undergoing a serious crisis. Indeed, Philip had been unfaithful, but infidelity is not a crime. According to the lawyers upon learning of the affair, Carissa fell into a deep depression, exacerbated by her unstable emotional state during pregnancy, leading her to end her own life. Remarkably, the court decided to release the accused on bail, allowing him to await the new hearings in freedom. This decision outraged and offended Carissa's family, but all their complaints were dismissed. The process was resumed only in 2019, this time, Philip was charged with manslaughter and failure to render aid. It was alleged that he saw the state his wife was in, but still allowed her to take a bath. After finding her unconscious in the water, he did nothing to assist her. The defense insisted that Carissa had simply slipped, hit her head on the edge of the bathtub, and drowned, and her husband was not at home at that moment to save her. Philip was found guilty again, but this time of manslaughter. He was again released on bail pending the final verdict. The Darwin family was outraged, demanding a just punishment for the person responsible for their daughter's and sister's death. Carissa's mother even suffered a heart attack after learning that her former son-in-law had been released again. In January 2020, the defendant was found guilty of manslaughter, but the sentence remained unchanged at 15 years in prison. Following this, he filed another appeal, and his lawyer managed to secure his release on bail once more. The ongoing releases seemed to mock the grieving family. This time, the defense insisted that Philip could not have known that his wife had taken a potent substance and was in danger, and therefore did not prevent her from taking a bath. However, in May 2022, the Supreme Court unexpectedly rejected the submitted appeal deemed the lawyer's arguments unconvincing, and upheld the sentence for Granvin, sending him to prison for 15 years. Overall, the legal proceedings against Carissa's perpetrator lasted more than 11 years, most of which he spent in freedom. Carissa's relatives never came to terms with the final verdict of manslaughter. No story is more sorrowful in the world than the tale of Romeo and Juliet, concludes the Duke in the most famous story about two lovers. Yet in Shakespeare's tragedy, Romeo and Juliet end their lives by their own choice, while in our story, the young lover solves the problem differently. The creation of the Borden family began in Missouri. Michael and Catherine met in school, 
They were classmates. Michael was captivated by his blonde, radiant, and responsive classmate. In the upper grades, he tried various ways to get her attention. He helped with homework and invited her out for walks. This way, they became best friends and spent a lot of time together, learning lessons and sharing secrets with each other. Gradually, their friendship turned into something more, and they realized they were in love with each other. Michael invited Catherine on a date where he first declared his love. After some time, the young people got married. The wedding was a beautiful and memorable ceremony where Michael and Catherine promised to love each other in all life circumstances. After 10 years of marriage, the family moved to Leititz, Pennsylvania. Leititz was founded by members of the Moravian Church in 1756, and it was inhabited by descendants of Moravian communities. The primary population of the town were faithful families who sought refuge in their oasis from the horrors of modern life. Life in the town was quiet and peaceful. Many families belonged to the Christian Amish community and led a lifestyle befitting a believer. Their life was simple, with people trying to do without many modern technologies. The Borden family was deeply devout, so the choice of Lititz was no accident. This suburb seemed perfectly suited for the birth and upbringing of children. Life flowed so calmly that a new day was just like the last. This was precisely what the Bordens were looking for, complete family solitude and creation in solitude with God. Michael served in the local church community and taught lessons in Sunday school. Catherine primarily managed the household and assisted her husband in his work. In the community, Michael worked more for spiritual wealth. For everyday worldly needs, he had to work as a manager at a printing company. In the following years, they had five children, three boys, and two girls. Most families living in Lititz were large, with some having more than five children. Hoping to shield their children from the hardships and dangers of the larger world, families regularly attended church, while local teenagers joined youth groups and were homeschooled. Interactions between families were limited to joint religious societies and celebrations. The family idol created by Michael Borden lasted for many years, with children being raised in faith and discipline. In the early 2000s, the eldest sons, having reached adulthood, went to university and moved to another city to study. This left three children at home who continued their homeschooling to the delight of their parents. Neighbors and the couple's few friends spoke highly of the children's upbringing and their diverse interests. Kara, Caitlin, and Daniel were exemplary, kind, and responsive. But it wasn't always this way. As the eldest daughter Kara entered her teenage years, it turned the family's traditional ways upside down. Despite her father's prohibitions, she began playing in the local soccer team, sneaking out to discos, and thoughtlessly doing everything she had been forbidden to do before. The young beauty's behavior deeply shook her father. Many hours of talks and instructions did not resonate in Kara's heart. Reasons for arguments appeared, which time and again led to the young rebel's escape. The girl openly showed interest in young men and sought relationships. Thus, in 2005, 18-year-old David and 14-year-old Kara met in a support group for students involved in homeschooling issues. The young people, with their passionate hearts attracted to all things forbidden, quickly established warm, friendly relations. Secretly from their parents, they agreed and created social media profiles, where they began actively exchanging messages. The correspondence was lengthy and very emotional. They exchanged well-encoded messages to keep their communications secret from everyone as long as possible. After a while, exchanging letters was not enough, and they began secretly meeting. At first, these were harmless walks in quiet, secluded places around the city. Then their friendly relationship evolved into a romantic one. They ran away together at night to discos and spent time together until morning. David was older and had already experienced first love and disappointment. Kara was so young that her new, bright feelings could hardly be contained. She didn't just walk, she seemed to fly, and a happy smile never left her beautiful face. Meeting David brought back the obedient Kara to her parents. Her father was overjoyed, believing that the teenage challenges were a thing of the past. But Michael was mistaken. 
Only the fear of being discovered by her parents quelled the girl's inner fire as she hid her love from them. This deeply saddened Kara. She knew what their reaction to such early relationships would be, as she had been instilled with entirely different concepts of possible love between a man and a woman from childhood, trying to protect her from such knowledge for as long as possible. Fearing their parents' negative reaction, the young couple carefully guarded their secret. But sooner or later, all secrets come to light. One day, unable to hold back, Kara shared her secret with her sister. She showed her a photo of David, shared how their relationship began, and that they were so in love and determined to be together against all odds that they were ready to run away. Her sister, fearful for Kara, told their mother about the planned elopement. Thus, the secret of the young lovers was revealed. One early morning, the young woman climbed through the window into the house and quietly, like a mouse, went up to her room. Elated, Kara was returning from another date with her David. She entered her room and froze. Her mother was sitting on her bed. Everything became clear without words. After breakfast, a conversation took place in which her parents forbade her any relationship with the young man. They were shocked, having shielded their children from violence, controlled substances, and other negative stories that such misfortune had befallen them. Kara's father was so outraged and disappointed that he forbade her from leaving her room. That night, Kara Borden spent in David's house. At 5.30 a.m., the young lover dropped her off near her house. They agreed that as soon as Kara safely returned to her room, she would send him a text message. However, the awaited message never came. David called her home several times and sent a few messages on social media. An hour later, Kara informed him that she was caught and asked him to come over so her parents could talk to him. David arrived at the appointed time. The conversation began with the father expressing deep indignation and forbidding the young man from seeing his daughter. Kara's parents' morals and stance were very conservative. They were categorically against relationships at their daughter's young age. Words of love did not touch the father's heart. He warned the young man that if he saw him with Kara again, he would be compelled to report him to the police for involvement with a minor. The lengthy, emotional conversation ended on a high note. Kara was locked in her room again, and David left with nothing. The young man got into his old car and drove away, crying for the first time over a girl, or maybe out of hurt that he was not taken seriously. The separation was very difficult. The lovers struggled greatly through the long days apart. They couldn't withstand the test of separation. So they devised a plan, deceive everyone by accepting Kara's father's conditions, pretend to break up, but continue their secret love. And they convincingly played the part of former lovers. In public places or at church, they didn't even greet each other. Kara's parents were appeased, convinced they had protected their daughter from a youthful mistake. David missed her terribly. In the evenings, he read Shakespeare, imagining openly serenading his beloved like Romeo. But in the Capulet and Montague tragedy, the lovers could not reconcile their families and receive their blessing. David Ludwig took decisive action. He called Kara's home asking for a meeting with her father. The young man was very serious and asked his beloved to talk about their upcoming marriage. On November 13, 2005, David Ludwig arrived at the Borden residence for a talk with Michael, the father of his beloved Kara. He announced his love for Kara, their ongoing relationship, and their plans to marry. Michael's response was dismissive. That will never happen. Anticipating such a response and coming prepared, David, fueled by rage, drew a handgun and shot Michael in the back as he was walking towards the front door. Then, David sought out Kara's mother, Catherine, and shot her while she was sitting on a chair. David then searched for Kara in the house, calling out for her, but he couldn't find her. Afterwards, he got into his car and started to drive away when he saw Kara running down the road towards him. She got into the car and told David she wanted to go as far away as possible, get married, 
and start a new life. The young couple fled the city in the boy's red car. But why would a 14-year-old girl run away with a young man who had just shown such brutality? Wasn't she shocked and scared? Both were considered good kids. How did they turn into criminals? Kara Borden was reported missing for 24 hours after her parents, Michael and Catherine Borden, were found deceased. After reviewing surveillance footage, the police followed the trail of the teenagers. The footage also proved that Kara had not resisted but willingly accompanied David. Charges of abducting Kara were dropped against David Ludwig. Alerts were issued across the East as Pennsylvania and Indiana police investigated sightings of the couple heading west in a red Volkswagen Jetta. Authorities received a tip on Monday morning about a vehicle matching that description parked near a truck stop outside of Fort Wayne. Police headed to the area, but the car was gone. State police were alerted, and patrols spotted the car around noon on I-70 in Belleville. David Ludwig merged onto the interstate, leaving them on a five-mile chase at speeds of 90 to 95 miles per hour on a two-lane highway. State Trooper David Cox, who was involved in the pursuit, described Ludwig as extremely reckless and dangerous at that moment, causing multiple accidents like in an action movie. The saga of the runaway lovers became a top national news story. Television broadcasts showed the capture of the teenage fugitives after the boy had ended the lives of his girlfriend's parents and took her with him. It turned out the lovers planned to escape far away, get married, and start a new life. The district attorney, commenting on the investigation, stated that the earlier abduction charge against the teenager would be dropped, but the charges for the demise of Michael and Catherine Borden would remain. Ludwig and Kara Beth fled together after the incident and were on the run from the authorities for about 28 hours before being apprehended in Indiana. Kara Beth was not charged with any crime. David Ludwig was detained without bail on charges of ending lives and abduction. Kara Borden was taken into the care of relatives and church members. David Ludwig was arrested on November 14, 2005, after a high-speed chase ended with his vehicle crashing into a tree. He was charged with the demise of the Bordens following a prolonged dispute. Fourteen-year-old Kara Borden faced no charges. On November 16, David Ludwig was extradited back to Pennsylvania after waiving extradition. The failed Romeo confessed to two counts of intentional harm. It was a deliberate act. I intended to shoot them if they got in our way, and I did. During the search of the young man's vehicle upon his arrest, no weapons were found. But when police visited Ludwig's home, they discovered 54 firearms. This arsenal belonged to Ludwig's father, a hunter who taught his son how to handle weapons. An 18-minute video from a laptop in his home showed Ludwig discussing plans for an armed invasion of another family's home, showing him bringing weapons into the house. The court documents state they abandoned this plan due to too many cars present. The police declared Kara Borden a victim in the case, yet Ludwig filed court documents claiming surveillance footage from various stores along their route would prove she was not abducted. Ludwig did not resist efforts to return him to Pennsylvania. A Pennsylvania judge ordered him held without bail. He was not represented by an attorney during the charge presentation. A preliminary hearing was set for November 23rd. The trial of the young individual responsible for ending two adult lives in front of their children was brief, as detailed in court documents. Kara's 13-year-old sister, Caitlin, told investigators that her parents were shot after arguing with David for about an hour. According to court documents, Caitlin saw Ludwig shoot her father, then ran to the bathroom where she heard a second shot, presumably the one that took her mother's life. Ludwig then ran through the house calling for Kara, she told investigators. The couple's nine-year-old son ran to neighbors who called 911, reporting the tragic event. In June 2006, David Ludwig entered a plea agreement with District Attorney Donald R. Tuktaro, who had sought the death penalty as punishment. Thus, Ludwig pleaded guilty to two counts of first-degree perpetrating among other charges and was immediately sentenced to two consecutive life sentences of 9.5 to 19 years 
and was also ordered to pay $125,000 in restitution. Since 2006, Kara Borden has been under guardianship, represented by a legal counsel. In written statements published on November 22, 2005, the abduction charge against David G. Ludwig was dropped. The court concluded that Kara Borden left with Ludwig of her own free will. Ludwig's lawyer reportedly stated that Kara voluntarily accompanied David during their journey through three states, and surveillance recordings show that Borden had ample opportunity to escape. Kara admitted that she ran after Ludwig as he left her house. Kara Borden simply wished to marry her beloved, David Ludwig, Kara Beth has been identified as a victim in this tragic situation, and thus, the district attorney of Lancaster County did not levy any criminal charges against her. Her actions, alongside Ludwig's during the investigation and the digital trail of emails, blogs, and texts they left behind, contributed to this decision. At a solemn memorial service held at Lancaster Bible College, Kara Beth, amidst her siblings, mourned the loss of her parents the Borden family's neighborhood showed its respect and remembrance by adorning mailboxes with white ribbons. The loss left five children without the guidance and love of their parents. George Landis, an elder from the Monterey Chapel, reflected on the incident by saying that the purpose behind such loss is known only to God, reassuring that Mike and Katie are in a better place. Vera Zimmerman, 50, familiar with the Borden family and Ludwig's mother for seven years, remarked on the upbringing of the children, pointing out that a lapse in judgment led to the unfortunate events. Friends and neighbors recalled Kara Borden as a joyful and sociable young girl, known for her babysitting in the neighborhood and her passion for soccer. Kevin Eschleman, executive pastor at Ephrata Community Church, noted her regular participation in youth group activities. However, Underlying tensions between Kara and her parents were noted by Zimmerman, highlighting concerns over Kara's interest in boys. Samuel P. Lohr, a friend of Ludwig, disclosed to authorities their secret intimate relationship, marked by flirtatious electronic communications and inappropriate image exchanges, according to legal documents. Zimmerman mentioned a significant decision by Kara's parents to disconnect her internet service in response to her relationship with David, indicating their disapproval. The peaceful town was left in shock by the grim events that unfolded, resonating beyond the local community to wider circles, especially those involved in homeschooling. Friends of the family struggled to comprehend how such sheltered children could commit acts of grave severity. Officially, they weren't considered a couple due to parental disapproval of their relationship, shared Stephanie Mammon, a 16-year-old neighbor of the Borden family. This incident underscores the dilemma where David Ludwig, faced with opposition, chose violence as a solution to his problems. David G. Ludwig's appeal for release was ultimately denied by the state appellate court, as announced by the Lancaster County District Attorney's Office. Following his sentencing on June 20th, Ludwig underwent various assessments at Camp Hill before being moved to a state prison in Indiana County to start serving his life sentence for the taking the life of his girlfriend's parents. David Ludwig, at 19, was transferred on August 3rd to the State Correctional Institution at Pine Grove, announced by Susan Norton, spokesperson for the State Department of Corrections. The state chose the Indiana State Prison for Ludwig because of its youthful offender program. Designed for inmates aged 15 to 20, the program aims to teach self-responsibility, discipline, respect for others, and self-worth. According to the Department of Corrections, Pine Grove, opened in 2000, houses some of the state's most challenging young offenders in a therapeutic community setting. Inmates at Pine Grove start their day at 6.10 a.m. with a roll call, followed by a 6.30 a.m. workout session including squats, push-ups, and jogging in place. They return to their cells at 7.15 a.m. to get ready for breakfast at 7.30 a.m., with lunch at 11.30 and dinner at 4.20 p.m. The bulk of the day is filled with four hours of educational classes, ranging from culinary arts, business, computer drafting, heating and cooling system installation, to building maintenance, 
and four hours of personal life management skills training. Inmates also participate in a 90-day military-style leadership development program fostering honor, discipline, honesty, and respect. Transitioning from the county jail, where Ludwig earned his high school diploma, to the state correctional facility was a challenge for the young man, stated Merrill M. Spann, one of Ludwig's attorneys. He will also be amongst young people from the general population and will be able to have visitors. The change was difficult because the county jail was smaller, and he had gotten used to the environment, Spann said. The cost of housing an inmate at Pine Grove, which employs about 430 people, is approximately $120 a day. Mr. Ludwig will be assigned jobs such as janitorial work or food service, and he will engage in daily recreational and educational activities, Norton stated. Inmates can earn between 18 to 42 cents an hour working as carpenters, plumbers, cooks, and laborers. The money earned can be used to purchase clothing, footwear, food, and personal items at the prison commissary. Most of the 250 inmates at Pine Grove stay until they turn 22, after which they are transferred to adult prisons to serve the remainder of their sentences. David Ludwig now 37, is serving two consecutive life sentences for shooting Michael and Catherine Borden in their home in November 2005 after they told him he could no longer see their 14-year-old daughter, Cara Borden. In his latest petition, Ludwig referred to alleged issues, including being treated as a juvenile offender serving a life sentence. He cited the 2012 U.S. Supreme Court ruling which found life imprisonment for juvenile offenders to be unconstitutional. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court recently denied the request, agreeing with Lancaster County Judge David Ashworth, who previously deemed the challenge untimely and unfounded, according to the county prosecutor's office. Ashworth stated that Ludwig does not deserve the same consideration as minors because he was 18 and a half at the time of the tragedies. David Ludwig is currently incarcerated in Luzerne County. Cara Beth Borden, the 14-year-old girlfriend of 18-year-old David Ludwig, who is accused of ending the lives of the Borden parents and fleeing with her to Indiana, has reunited with her family in Pennsylvania. However, as CBS News correspondent Sharon Alfonsi reports, it remains unclear what role Cara Borden may have played in the incident. According to Alfonsi, the police now view Borden as a victim. She has not been arrested, which leaves open the possibility that she played a significant role in the unfolding events. Given her age of 14, there's also speculation about potential charges against Ludwig for involvement with a minor. Warwick Police Chief Richard F. Garippoli Jr. told CBS News, Kara is upset, she's crying, she's 14 years old and it seems we forget that. She's devastated. This has completely changed the fabric of our community, a Borden neighbor involved in the memorial service told CBS News. They were wonderful people and we'll miss them terribly. It's complete madness, absolute madness, said the Lancaster County, Pennsylvania coroner G. Gary Kirchner. This isn't a Romeo and Juliet deal. It's much worse. Thus, a decision made in a moment of fury and desperation took three lives. Why do we say three when there are two victims? Having received two life sentences, 18-year-old David Ludwig will live out his days in prison, never again to make a choice independently and never to be free again. But is that truly living? The community long remembered this terrible story and couldn't understand how such positive children could so casually commit such evil. Unfortunately, homeschooling didn't prevent this horrific tragedy. Growing up and being educated in a Christian environment didn't stop the cruel act. Perhaps the parents, trusting in God and faith, missed something crucial in raising their children or failed to convey the important lessons of Christian faith effectively. Maybe they weren't fulfilling their parental duties adequately, not having heartfelt conversations with their children, or trusting each other enough to prevent their daughter's secret escapes and stop the quest for new experiences. Perhaps it would have been better to allow the children to live without mentioning the Almighty, still sharing with their children the life they themselves had lived at a young age. 
where there weren't so many restrictions and deprivations. Deciding for the children, parents eventually face disappointment from the decisions made later on. We can only speculate what might have prevented this tragedy. From all we've learned, one thing is clear. Violence always leads to more violence. When we're taught to live with violence, we become good as long as we're coerced and accepted as part of life. The more we practice, the more we endure, and then use violence to solve our problems. Unfortunately, much of this acceptance of violence comes from Christian homes, but such violence is entirely against Christian teachings. On December 1st, 2022, the Mendoza Criminal Court stood waiting, holding its breath. The atmosphere in the courtroom was tense, and the surrounding area was filled with people waiting for the verdict. On the dock sat a woman aged 32, dressed in a black dress, with white beads around her neck. Her face expressed not a single emotion, and her eyes burned with only equanimity and restraint. She was preparing to hear the judgment that would determine her fate and leave a mark on history. Everyone in the room had known this woman for many years, but now they were faced with a mystery that was difficult for them to understand. Outside the courtroom doors, the approaching footsteps of the judge could be heard, like the pounding of a heart, echoing in the silence and felt in every corner of the place. Everyone knew that what was at stake today was not only the fate of the woman in the dock, but also the truth that had remained in the shadows for so long. There was a whole story behind this woman, the events of which were as mysterious as she was. The truth of this real crime is hidden in the details, and the trial becomes a real challenge for all involved. Monado is a small town hidden among the mountains and valleys of the Argentine province of Mendoza. This is the place where nature reveals its most beautiful colors. In autumn, the streets are sprinkled with golden leaves, and the mountain peaks are painted in shades of orange and red. The residents of Monado know each other well, and everyone can tell the biography of their neighbors. Here, people share joys and sorrows, support each other in difficult moments, and celebrate important events together. In this secluded place, among the mountains and valleys, Rolando Angel Aquino and Karen Oviedo began a romance that would later shake Minato and all of Argentina. When the streets of the city, surrounded by colors of autumn gold, as if frozen in anticipation of something long awaited, the fates of the two young people of this story intertwined. Rolando Angel Aquino, a man with a magnetism capable of attracting the attention of others, could not help but notice the exciting gaze of Karen Oviedo. She was a woman with fire in her eyes, a passion for life, and an energy that instantly won his heart. The young people were very similar in their interests and dreams, and the determination and entrepreneurial thirst of both inspired them. This meeting was an accident that gave them a chance for true happiness. Finally, they found in this relationship what they had been looking for in others for so long. So in 2016, the lovers started living together and opened their own business, a warehouse which was located in the house where they lived. Karen has always had a special eye for detail, and she lovingly created a sign on one of the windows for customer service. Next to it were lists of items for sale. It was their little corner that they were rightfully proud of. The people of Minato watched this happy and determined couple with interest and respect. Everyone wondered who these young people were and how they managed to accomplish so much. Many people knew Karen from childhood, but Rolando remained a mystery. No one knew anything about his past, except that he came from Bolivia. Rolando not only ran the business with Karen, but also worked at the fair in Guimelin, where wholesale fruit sales were held. Looking at this couple, it seemed like they had found their little paradise on earth. But sometimes, even the strongest and most sincere relationships can face a test. One day, Rolando was taken aback when he caught Karen in the car with another man. His reaction was a flash of anger. In that moment, he nearly destroyed everything inside the interior of the car. The picture of happiness crumbled in a matter of minutes. But then, Rolando agreed to give them a chance, choosing to forgive and continue to move forward with his beloved. In the eyes of others, they remained a model of an ideal couple, able to overcome all difficulties together. 
Rolando Angel Aquino is an enigmatic figure who was born in 1987 in Bolivia. His exact date of arrival in Argentina remains unknown, like many other aspects of his life. As the eldest of seven children in his family, Rolando learned from an early age the value of family bonds and hard work. His ideal was a happy family filled with joy and children's laughter. In his youth, he met Carolina Chavez, from whom he later had a son. Despite the difficulties, the couple remained on good terms. Later in his life appeared Soledad Guardio, who gave him another son, Elias. Relationships with Soledad also did not work out. However, Rolando was always a devoted father who took care of his children. He kept in touch and always maintained a warm relationship with the mothers of his children. From a young age, Rolando was a physically fit man who took care of his health by playing sports and playing soccer for the local team. Colleagues and loved ones described him as a kind and very hardworking man. Neighbors in his neighborhood got along well with him, but Rolando always showed a distinct shyness in socializing. Karen was born March 30, 1990, and spent her childhood and youth in Minato, in the same house where she and Rolando later established their warehouse. She was well known among the locals as an outgoing and open-minded woman. Like Rolando, Karen dreamed of a happy and successful family with a caring and devotedly loving man. However, it took her some time to find the one man with whom she could build her happiness. Before meeting Rolando, Karen had already attempted to create a happy relationship that resulted in the birth of two wonderful girls. One of her former partners, Raul Ojeda, became the father of one of them, and Karen married him in 2013. However, as time went on, that marriage was on the verge of breaking up. According to Raul, financial difficulties were one of the reasons for the conflict. Worried about his life and in search of new opportunities, Raul decided to leave his family. On the pretext of buying some necessary item, he fled the city and traveled abroad, changing buses to make it difficult to track his whereabouts. In this way, he sought to evade all attempts to locate him. In the summer of 2019, nine-year-old Elias arrived at Rolando and Karen's house. They had many plans for the near future that they wanted to spend together. However, on the morning of July 12, 2019, when Rolando came to wish his son a good morning before leaving for work, he noticed that the boy was not feeling well. The father immediately decided to take his son to the children's hospital to see a pediatrician. There, after examination, it became clear that Elias's condition is critical and he was immediately sent to the intensive care unit. Despite the best efforts of the medical staff, little Elias died shortly after he was brought to the hospital. The amazing thing was that he left home perfectly healthy, without any unusual symptoms, and arrived at his father's house also perfectly healthy. However, the medical report was devastating. It stated that Elias died of third-degree poisoning, which caused multi-organ failure and cerebral these conclusions left Elias's parents in complete bewilderment, as their son seemed to be completely healthy and active, and suddenly died of an incomprehensible disease. Following their professional duty, the doctors insisted on conducting an additional forensic medical examination. However, Elias's mother and grandmother, dumbfounded by the loss, refused this procedure. Karen offered to cremate the boy's body, but Elias's mother also refused preferring to bury her son in a private cemetery so that she could come and lay flowers on his grave. Elias's death was a blow that broke Rolando's heart. He was devastated by the unexpected loss of his youngest son. The caring and loving Karen never left Rolando for a moment. She took care of all the business, carefully supported her boyfriend, and helped him through his pain and grief. Over time, with the warmth and support of the woman he loved, the pain began to subside. Sixteen months after this terrible tragedy, Rolando decided to take a big step and propose to Karen. They got married, and the man was sure that this woman would always be by his side. However, their happiness turned out to be short-lived. On February 6, 2022, Karen returned home after a beauty salon and working out at the gym, and noticed that Rolando began to experience serious health problems. The next day, February 7th, she found a medical ambulance outside their home. Rolando, 35, suddenly felt very ill. After vomiting profusely, he collapsed in the living room of their home 
and the housekeeper called for emergency medical help. The doctors allowed Karen to pass to her husband. When Rolando was taken to the Santa Maria Clinic, his condition was critical. Despite the efforts of the medical staff, the young man passed away on February 9th. Years, but now they were... The cause of his death was severe poisoning. Given that Rolando was a healthy man who was active in sports, the medical staff began to ask questions of his wife. Karen confirmed that Rolando was taking medication to remove dark spots on his skin. For specialists, this information was highly suspicious. Tests revealed a significant excess of calcium oxalate crystals in Rolando's system, which is a characteristic sign of poisoning by ethylene glycol, the main component of antifreeze for cars. The investigation into this strange and unexpected death of Rolando became a high priority for authorities. The prosecutor's office was actively investigating the neighborhood where the Aquino couple lived. Neighbors became important witnesses, reporting that Karen had repeatedly given her husband some unknown medication. They were aware that she used these medications to go to a party without her husband. However, neighbors also expressed doubts about what happened to Rolando's son, which led investigators to think and consider the theory that Karen may have only wanted to temporarily sedate her husband rather than take his life. However, the findings of the Technology Crimes Unit officers completely ruled out this hypothesis. Requests for various forensic examinations were sent, and Karen, the wife of the deceased, was thoroughly questioned. Many contradictions arose during the interrogation. The investigating officers called on Karen to name the substance she had slipped to her husband before his death. The woman claimed that it was just a skin blemish remedy and that she had administered it through an IV. However, when she was asked to provide a vial of the solution, Karen said that the housekeeper had already thrown the drug away. A further interview was then conducted with the housekeeper, Claudia Cortez, who denied Karen's statement regarding the discarded vial. Of both inspired them. This meeting was an accident that gave them a chance for true happiness. She also reported that she had overheard a conversation between the couple in which Rolando expressed dissatisfaction with the medication he was receiving. Karen was detained during the investigation, and her cell phone was seized. Rolando's family, friends, and teammates were shocked by the news of his death. For visitors to the Aquino couple's warehouse and other locals, it was also a shock. No one could understand what had happened or why the father of the family had bid farewell to the world so suddenly. Raul, Karen's ex-husband, was extremely surprised when rumors of a deliberate poisoning began to spread. He claimed that his ex-spouse was always affectionate and never violent towards him. After analyzing the suspect's phone, it was discovered that Karen had searched a search engine for information on the deadliest poisons and how to clear her search history. In addition, records of her two ethylene glycol orders from an online store were found. The Agency for Toxic Substances, as well as the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, found that it is a synthetic substance that absorbs water and is used in the production of antifreeze. This product is odorless, has a sweet taste, and is extremely dangerous to humans. With the preliminary results of the forensic examination and all the information discovered, the prosecutor's office charged Karen with willfully poisoning Rolando with a poisonous substance diluted with orange juice. Consumption of this beverage caused Rolando's health to seriously deteriorate, and he died. A series of strange and tragic events in the Aquino family forced the authorities to take drastic action. By mid-February, with enough evidence against Karen, an aggravated murder charge was filed. In parallel, suspicions surfaced as to the cause of nine-year-old Elias's death, triggering a new investigation. The, the mother claimed that Elias was fully healthy and active, and that he had suddenly gone into a coma while at his father's house, from which he never came out. The boy's death certificate indicated that the cause was a malfunction of his internal systems and cerebral thrombosis. However, investigators persistently doubted that Elias, at age nine, could have died of such causes, especially given his overall health. The prosecutor's office requested information about possible purchases of ethylene glycol and received a response confirming that Karen purchased the poison on July 2, 2019, shortly before the boy arrived at the Aquino home. Information from Elias's relatives also confirmed that Karen insisted on cremating his body. 
but the birth mother rejected the idea and preferred to bury her son. The evidence gathered was enough for prosecutor Claudia Rios to file new aggravated murder charges against Karen on March 4th, related to the poisoning of Elias. On March 14th, a judge ordered pre-trial detention for the woman, who tried to appeal, but the judge rejected it, affirming that she should remain behind bars until the trial began. That trial began 10 months later and was an important step in unraveling this complex and dark story. The long-awaited trial began in the Mendoza Criminal Court, attracting public immediate attention. November 28, 2022 was the beginning of the nationwide trial of Karen Oviedo. Two indictments were pending. The first, led by Prosecutor Fernando Guzzo, concerned the murder of Elias, and the second, involving Claudia Rios, touched on the murder of Rolando. When the trial began, Rolando's eldest son, Javier Aquino, who was only 15 years old, appeared as a plaintiff, supported by counsel. And in search of new opportunities, Raul decided to... In addition, Kimberly's own blood was not on the murder weapon or on her hands, which would be impossible if she had actually shot herself in the head with the gun to her chin. But there was a drop of her husband's blood on the thumb of her hand. On top of that, there were several searches on Christopher's work computer for detailed staging of the crime scene. Kimberly's physician also testified at the trial, stating that the young woman suffered from insomnia, headaches, and high blood pressure, for which she was prescribed a number of medications, but that she had no bad thoughts or desire to harm herself or others. The defendant was found guilty on each of the counts charged. For such a horrific crime, Christopher was sentenced to four life sentences one for each family member, with no possibility of ever being released. Shortly after such a harsh sentence was handed down, Vaughn unexpectedly stated that he remembered in great detail the events of that day and had not lost his memory at all. According to him, shots rang out after he left the car, but he did not immediately realize what was happening. Then he saw the bodies of the children, and at that moment, his wife shot him in the leg, she shouted that it was all his fault, and then put a bullet in his head. The new testimony of the convict had no effect on the verdict, because it sounded more than ridiculous. However, Christopher's parents have been actively trying to justify their son in the eyes of the public. For several years, they regularly take part in all sorts of talk shows, give interviews and blogs and social networks, where they talk about how unhappy in marriage was their heir. They also systematically blame all the troubles on the Phillips family, whose members, according to them, from the very beginning, did not accept their son-in-law and did everything to turn his life into a nightmare. The prosecution decided to address several questions to Karen. Prosecutor Guzzo, focusing on key points, asked her if Karen had suggested that her son Rolando be cremated. To this question, Karen responded emphatically, that the decision on this matter was not up to her, and she had never made any such suggestion. The prosecution called as witnesses relatives of the deceased to reveal further details of what had happened. Soledad, Elias's mother, told the court that after her son's death, in 2003, this high-profile story shook the whole of Brazil and was widely covered by the international media. Hundreds of law enforcers, rescuers, and volunteers from among those who cared about the story were searching for the young couple who disappeared in the forests of Embuguasu province. They had hoped to find them alive, but unfortunately those hopes were not realized, and the last days of the young people turned into a real nightmare. But grief-stricken members of the families of the missing ahead awaited another ordeal, when the main criminal, rapist, torturer, and brutal killer was not punished, moreover found himself in better conditions than he lived before. Who are Liana Friedenbach and Felipe Café? Liana Bay Friedenbach was born in Sao Paulo in May 1987. The girl was the eldest of two children at her parents. She grew up in a fairly well-known and wealthy family. The head of the family, Henry Friedenbach, was a successful lawyer and a very respected man in the city. Felipe Silva Café was also a native of Sao Paulo, where he was born in July 1984. But he was brought up in a rather modest, large family, from childhood used to work part-time, tried to provide for himself independently, and help his relatives. 
Young people met as school children. Between them, there was a friendship, which grew into mutual sympathy and the first youthful love, but they had to hide it in every possible way. It is worth noting that Liana's parents were religious people. They brought up their daughter in strictness. She attended Sunday school from an early age and regularly went to church. Father and mother were categorically against her romantic relationships at such a young age. In addition, social inequality also played a significant role in this matter, because the girl, as I have already said, was from a wealthy family, and her chosen one was poor. But the prohibitions of parents did not force the young people to part. They simply began to hide their affair, secretly arranging dates in different places where no one could see them in order to spend at least a little time together. One last trip. In the fall of 2003, the lovers decided to get away from everyone for a while, taking a trip to a remote, deserted area to be alone for a while. They carefully prepared for the trip, which was to be an exciting adventure for them. And above all, the boys took care of a plausible alibi that would justify their absence and would not arouse suspicion. Felipe told his parents that he and his friends were going on a camping trip Liana, on the other hand, could think of nothing better to say than that she was going on a sightseeing trip with the guys from church. She knew for sure that this excuse would work and her parents would let her go, no questions asked. The Friedenbach and Kaffee families believed the stories made up by the teenagers and let their children go to their deaths without worrying about anything. Liana and Felipe were unspeakably happy. They could enjoy each other's company for a whole week without fear of inhibitions and censure from their parents. The young people decided to go to a picturesque province called Embuguasu. They took with them a tent, sleeping bags, some personal belongings, and a small stock of provisions. But the couple had practically no money, and this caused some difficulties. Being students, they had the right to free public transportation, so the guys thought out and calculated their route in advance to get to their destination by bus. Early in the morning of October 31st, the lovers met at the agreed place, taking care that no one who knew them could see them together. They took the first bus, and after reaching another city in the late evening, they spent the night right in the bus station. Then two more transports took them to their desired location. From there, they had to walk a few kilometers to a deserted, deserted place hidden in the woods, where they planned to camp and spend a few days alone with each other. The day was warm and sunny, and the young people, in spite of their fatigue after the long journey, were in good spirits, joking, laughing, and making plans for their little vacation. When they reached the place marked on the map, they began to set up their modest but cozy camp, uninvited guests. When Liana and Philippa traveled to such a remote and secluded place, they did not take into account the fact that in those areas reigns poverty, against which crime thrives so the appearance of well-dressed young men with large backpacks and bags did not go unnoticed. As the couple walked through the forest to the abandoned farm where they planned to stay, they caught the eye of local bandits fishing near a pond. They were Paulo Cesar de Silva Marques, nicknamed Pernambuco, and Roberto Alves Cardoso, known as Chiampino. The latter was only 16 years old, but he was already the leader of the gang he organized. The criminals were interested in strangers, especially they liked a beautiful young girl. In addition, they decided that in their backpacks there was something to gain, and they could rob them. The bandits stealthily followed the guys and began to watch, lurking in the thickets. The lovers set up a tent, had a snack, and then began to beautify the place of their parking lot. The intruders sat in ambush until they were sure that no one else would join the young men, and they had no weapons on them. Hernanbuku and Chiampino then attacked Liana and Felipe, threatening them, and the latter, frightened, did not even try to run away or fight back against the unknown assailants. Having searched all the bags and backpacks, the criminals found nothing that could interest them. Then the bandits decided that they could demand ransom for the boy and the girl from their relatives. Liana, who was scared to death, immediately confirmed that she was from a rich family and her father would give them as much money as they asked for. The criminals were happy about this turn, but since they had no experience in such cases, they did not know how to organize everything in order to stay with the money and free in the end. Prisoners. While the plan was maturing, 
and the bandits were trying to figure out who they had in their hands and how much they could ask for their lives, they decided to hide the prisoners so they couldn't escape. Initially, they were taken to a dilapidated structure near the very farm where the boys were staying, but there were no windows or doors. It was soon decided to bring the pair to the home of one of the gang members. There, Philippe was tied up and severely beaten so that he could not make an escape and offer no resistance. That same night, all the gang members took turns taking advantage of the bound and helpless girl, finally breaking her morally. The criminals could not figure out how to demand and collect the ransom, so they simply decided to get rid of the captives and hide their bodies somewhere in the woods so that they would never be found. After torturing the boys, the next day they were taken to a deserted place in the woods. The half-dead Philippe Hernambuku took them deep into the forest from where a shot was heard, and then the bandit returned alone. Liana realized what had happened and that her beloved was no longer alive, although the kidnappers tried to assure her that they had released the young man. They had other plans for the beautiful young Liana. The scoundrels wanted to keep her as a plaything until they got bored with her, especially since no one had started looking for the missing boys at that time. A couple of days after her daughter's departure, her parents found out that there was no excursion trip with the guys from the church, and Liana's friends don't know where she went. The Friedenbach family guessed that their heiress had run off with her boyfriend and immediately contacted his parents to find out where their children might be. But Café's family was sure their son had gone camping with his buddies, so there was nothing they could do to help locate the couple. The situation was complicated by the fact that neither of the young men had been in touch for several days and their phones were turned off. Thanks to his connections and money, Henri put on their feet literally all the police in the city. Step by step, bit by bit, they managed to reconstruct the route the young people took after they had run away from home by trickery. The police soon reached Mbuguasu, where the boys got off their last bus, and further their way lay through a deserted wooded area. It was also there that their phones were last online. A large-scale search began, involving police officers, rescuers, and just concerned people who, having learned about the incident, decided to help. A large local businessman also joined the operation, providing his personal helicopter to search from the air and spreading leaflets with photos of the missing young people. Their camp was found quite quickly, and it looked frightening. Despite the lack of signs of blood and fighting, it was clear that something terrible had happened here. The couple's personal belongings had been turned out of their bags and carelessly scattered. The tent had been opened from top to bottom with a knife, and the guy's cell phones were lying around. Scouring every mile, rescuers soon discovered Philippe's breathless body. The tied-up guy had been shot in the back of the head almost at point-blank range, so he had no chance of being rescued. It became clear that the probability of finding Liana alive is minimal, but hope, as they say, dies last. Henry Friedenbach involved the press in the search, making sure that the whole process was widely covered in the media, and as many people as possible learned about it. For any information about Liana's whereabouts, an impressive reward was announced, but it did not help the case, the massacre of Liana. After the criminals got rid of Felipe, they brought Liana back to the house where they had previously held them both. By then, the bandits had been joined by their accomplices, Antonio Gatano da Silva and Agnaldo Pires. Ciampino proudly announced to them that Liana was his property and could do whatever he wanted with her. He invited everyone to fulfill their dirtiest fantasies with Liana, and his offer was immediately accepted. A day later, after learning about the large-scale search operation, the criminals decided to change their location and moved with the victim to the house of Anthony Matias de Barros, another member of the gang. In the evening of the same day, they went fishing, taking Liana with them. The ringleader threw his jacket over her because it was chilly outside and he decided to show concern in this way. In the evening, the older brother of Ciampino, whom the juvenile delinquent had not told about his affairs, came to the same place. Ciampino told his brother that Liana was his lover, but he immediately recognized her as the wanted girl. He took his brother aside and said that his captive was being actively sought, so that the police were literally following them. Ciampino took his brother's words as a sign and a call to action. 
he decided that it was urgent to get rid of Liana and then run away and lay low. He lied to Liana, saying that she was free and he would lead her to the road. In fact, the bandit led his victim into the forest, where he brutally killed her with a knife and then smashed her head with a rock to make sure she was dead. Liana's body was not found until five days after the massacre. There was literally no life on her. She was very badly mutilated. Liana was wearing the killer's jacket, which later became one of the key pieces of evidence. The criminals were incredibly cruel, cynical, and ruthless, but at the same time as stupid and short-sighted. They did not try to run or hide, did not bother to destroy the physical evidence, and at the same time believed that no one would ever find them. This naive self-confidence of the bandits helped the police quickly identify them and apprehend all members of the criminal gang. Ciampino, as I have already said, left his jacket on the victim's body, which had his sweat marks on it. In addition, he brought the murder weapon to his house, washed it, and hid it in the yard, while he tried to wash the clothes with traces of the murdered girl's blood so that he could continue to wear them. According to the results of DNA analysis, it was possible to identify the gang members who had committed violence against Liana. All the gang members were apprehended almost simultaneously. The ringleader not only did not deny it, but immediately began to testify, boasting that it was he who had kidnapped, abused, and then killed the unfortunate victim. He described in detail everything that had happened to Liana in the last days of her life. Following a lengthy trial, almost all of the adult members of the criminal gang received fairly harsh sentences. Hernan Buca was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Felipe. Antonio Gatano de Silva, as well as Agnaldo Pires, also received life sentences. But Anthony Matias de Barros was sentenced to only six years in prison because he himself did not torture the victim, but provided the gang with his house, where it all took place. However, with the ringleader and the most brutal member of the gang, everything was not so simple. At the time of his crimes, he himself was barely 16 years old. For this reason, the guy was sent to a specialized prison for minors with a fairly mild regime. Ciampino made several escape attempts, behaved aggressively and inadequately, because of which he was appointed a psychiatric examination. He was found to have several mental abnormalities, which in themselves were not something dangerous, but in the sum gave a monstrous result, turning the young man into a sophisticated sadist and murderer without feelings of pity or remorse. After such a diagnosis, the criminal was transferred to a closed-type medical institution, where he was to undergo compulsory treatment and rehabilitation. No further punishment was ever achieved for him, despite numerous appeals filed by the families of the murdered young men. As a result, Ciampino ended up in better conditions than he had been in before the crime. He now had his own private, cozy room with a large TV, internet access, and a comfortable bed with an orthopedic mattress. He has a balanced four meals a day with a customized menu, which is part of the policy of the medical facility where he is being held. His monthly maintenance is estimated at about R$ $12,000. That's about $2,500. In recent years, the perpetrator has regularly petitioned for his release, noting that he has undergone a full course of treatment and no longer poses any threat to others, which means he can return to his normal life. This is a monstrous story. Domestic violence, unfortunately, was not uncommon at all times and often victims, for various reasons, prefer to silently tolerate this attitude to themselves, and the domestic tyrant, feeling his impunity, can overstep any boundaries. The worst thing in such situations is that children can become victims. A few years ago, the case of young Tylee Palmer shook the whole of Australia with its extraordinary cruelty and monstrous coincidence of circumstances, when a child from one dysfunctional family fell into another family even more terrible and cruel. The girl's birth mother, trying to protect her only daughter from her tyrant husband, gave her to another family out of the best intentions, but as it turned out, she put Tylee in the hands of death itself. The case under consideration is quite complex and ambiguous. There were several criminals, and all of them were members of the same family. At the same time, the investigation came to the conclusion that almost all of them were victims of domestic tyranny themselves, and now I will tell about everything in order. A girl from a dysfunctional family. 
Tylee Alicia Rose Palmer was born in a small Australian town, Logan City, Queensland, in April 2003. Unfortunately, the conditions in which the girl grew up were far from ideal. The head of the family abused hot drinks, was a man hot-tempered and aggressive. He repeatedly beat his wife in front of the child and at times got to the daughter herself. The girl was constantly under stress, lived in an atmosphere of fear and oppression. It is not surprising that over time she began to regularly run away from home so as not to hear the endless scandals of parents and not get under the hot hand of the father. About why the girl's mother, Cynthia Palmer, did not leave the man who abused her and her daughter, we can only guess. However, instead, the young woman chose to give her only child to another family, believing that this would be better. Subsequently, Cynthia repeatedly stated that it was a forced measure and that she was very sorry about it, but at that time to do otherwise could not, because she herself was hostage to circumstances. But there is another version, told by neighbors of the dysfunctional family. According to some reports, Cynthia herself is addicted to alcohol. She tried treatment, but to overcome addiction was not so easy. And after another escape Tylee from home, when she was found wandering the streets on the other side of the city, the Palmer family seriously interested in child protection services. Representatives of the service visited the family home and offered help and Cynthia did not refuse to have her daughter temporarily placed in a foster home. Given the environment in which the girl was brought up, it is not surprising that she grew up to be a difficult teenager with a difficult character. Therefore, finding her a foster family was not an easy task. She was constantly running away, loitering and begging on the streets, disobeying her guardians, doing everything in her own way. Tylee did not stay with her first two families for long, because her foster parents simply could not cope with her. She did not commit any serious offenses, but she was periodically accused of lying. The girl wanted the comfort of home, but did not imagine what it should be. And any disagreement with the household inevitably ended with the escape of the child, the Thorburn family. In early 2015, it seemed that the perfect foster family had been found for Tylee and was ready to welcome her with open arms. The Thorburn family consisted of four people. Spouses Rick and Julia Thorburn were raising two sons, Josh, who was already 19 years old at the time, and Trent, who was barely 18. The family lived in a spacious two-story house with a swimming pool located in a small country place in the suburbs of Brisbane. They owned their own horse farm, and Julia organized a private kindergarten at home, which was very popular and local parents willingly trusted the Thorburns with their children. The family was considered well-to-do and prosperous, well-regarded in their home state, and trustworthy. In addition, they had indicated a willingness to take a troubled teenager into their care, which was rare. Child Protective Services decided that this option was the most suitable for Tylee, and in January, the girl moved into a new home. At first, everything went according to the usual scenario. The girl rebelled, refused to live with her guardians and ran away from them several times, but each time the Child Welfare Service found her and sent her back. But as the months went by, Tylee seemed to calm down, accepted her new family, and got along with them. In reality, however, the outward well-being hit a real drama that soon spiraled into tragedy, the mysterious disappearance of Tylee. The girl studied in one of the local schools, which was located a few kilometers from the house of her guardians, so the foster father took Tylee to school every day and after school picked her up. She made a lot of friends in the new place who spoke of her as a kind, cheerful, and cheerful girl, but she still dreamed of returning to her home and kept in touch with her biological mother and grandmother. Tylee also occasionally complained of discomfort and even fear without specifying what exactly she was afraid of. On the morning of October 30th, 2015, Rick drove his car to school as usual and then returned home to do chores. But soon he received a phone call informing him that his adopted daughter had failed to show up for class. No one was particularly worried because the girl had run away many times before, but usually she returned in the evening or the next day. The guardians reported the incident to the police and almost immediately the search for missing Tylee began. All members of the family willingly cooperated with the investigation and claimed that no conflicts that could provoke a runaway between them and Tylee 
for a long time has not been. On the contrary, the girl was in good spirits and looked quite happy. According to the head of the family, he took his daughter to school, as he usually did, and then drove back home and tended to the horses until he received a call from a teacher and reported the disappearance of the girl. His spouse and sons confirmed these words. The next day, the Thorburns created a social media page dedicated to the search for Tylee. There they posted information about her, her photos, the time and circumstances of her disappearance, as well as a description of the clothes she was wearing that day. The couple asked anyone who knew anything about Tylee's whereabouts to report it to them or to the police, but no one ever called. Police also searched the family's home and estate, but found nothing suspicious there. Although the behavior of the foster parents seemed too calm, they had essentially nothing to charge them. Soon, the search operation was joined by many concerned people, sincerely concerned about the fate of the girl. They combed the area, pasted flyers with her photos, and interviewed local residents, hoping to get at least some useful information, a discovery on the riverbank. After a week of unsuccessful searches, two fishermen turned to the police, reporting a terrible find. According to the men, on the morning of November 5th, they went to the Pimpama River, but after barely casting their fishing rods, they noticed something strange in the swampy, shallow water. As they got closer, the fishermen were horrified as they realized that their find was nothing but human remains. The police officers who arrived on the call noted that it was the body of a short man, but it was so disfigured that it was impossible even to identify the sex of the deceased. There were no clothes on him, and no personal belongings could be found nearby. The body had numerous injuries that were initially thought to have been left by wild animals in the area. In addition, it was badly decomposed due to heat, moisture, and numerous insects, which were attracted by the characteristic odor. The gruesome find was sent for examination, where it was determined that it was a girl whose approximate age was between 12 and 16 years old. Then the police collected information about all missing young people recently and soon the corpse was identified. It was Tylee Palmer, which for almost a week the whole city was looking for. The cause of death was impossible to determine because the body had been in the water for a long time, but experts speculated that Tylee died of asphyxiation after discovering that her hyoid bone had been crushed. The most horrifying thing, however, was that the injuries, which were initially suspected to be animal bites, could have been inflicted by a person even before Tylee's death. It was immediately clear that Tylee's death was criminal in nature, so a criminal case was opened and a murder investigation was launched. But the investigation was moving very slowly because no serious leads could not be found yet, which meant that the process could take months or even years or turn into another unsolved crime. The case quickly gained publicity, so to say goodbye to the dead girl came almost a quarter of the city's population. People carried flowers, soft toys, and balloons to the place where the memorial service was held. On November 14th, the body of young Tylee was cremated. Tylee's birth mother gave a series of interviews to reporters in which she openly accused Child Protective Services of criminal negligence that led to the tragedy. The strange Thor Burns, the foster family willingly cooperated with the investigation from the beginning, but their behavior raised certain suspicions. The last person to see the girl alive was supposedly Rick, but no one could confirm that he actually brought his foster daughter to school on the morning of October 30th. His spouse and sons claimed to have seen Tylee get into the car. Surveillance cameras along the route to the school also showed the car traveling in that direction, but no footage of Tylee leaving her guardian's car could be found anywhere. None of the teachers or classmates saw the girl that day, either at school or on school grounds. Tylee seemed to have vanished, although investigators had growing doubts that Palmer was even in the car. Family members occasionally confused their testimony about the events of that day, but insisted that everything was as it always was and there was nothing to portend trouble. Unchildren's Secrets As part of the investigation, dozens of children and teenagers were interviewed, with whom the deceased went to the same school and was friends. All spoke positively about her but noted that recently Tylee had been worried about something, but she could not or was afraid to talk about it. A few days before the tragedy, Tylee asked a classmate to shelter her for a while. She said she was in trouble 
and the guardians would kill her. These words were not taken seriously, and the friend, though she felt sorry for her, could not bring someone to her house for a sleepover without parental consent. The other girl mentioned that Palmer had told her her secret. She was in love with the youngest of the Thorburn brothers, 18-year-old Trent. Moreover, she even bragged that they were romantically involved and would be together in the future. The latter revelation sounded rather strange because Tylee was only 12 years old, and a relationship with an older brother, even an adopted one, seemed something unlikely, like a childish fantasy. Nevertheless, the information she received was definitely something she had to check out. The members of the Thorburn family categorically denied any suspicions. They called their dead adopted daughter a liar, who wanted to draw attention to herself, and also suggested that the girl's school friends could have made up something themselves or fantasized. There was no solid evidence to suspect the guardians of committing a crime against Tylee, so they remained at large, continuing to do their usual business. Their private kindergarten continued to take children. The farm prospered, and they didn't have to deal with the pain of loss. For several months, the investigation was actually treading on the same ground. Local residents with previous convictions were questioned, and those previously suspected of crimes were checked. But the search yielded no results, and no new leads appeared. Even the announced high reward for any information about the case did not move the process forward. A parallel search was conducted in the area where Tylee's body was found. And a month later, under a layer of silt, were found a backpack and a shoe, which presumably could belong to the deceased. They were found 150 meters away from where the body was. These things were obviously wanted to get rid of so that they would never be found. The whole story gained a wide public resonance. The results of the search and investigation were broadcast on television, published in the press, and the residents of the city organized pickets demanding to find and punish the killer or killers. Some pickets were organized by the biological mother of the deceased Tylee. Eventually, it came to the point where the police appealed to possible accomplices of the perpetrator, promising them protection and immunity if they named the perpetrator or provided any substantial information. But this appeal also went unanswered. In six months, no new clues or avenues of inquiry have emerged. An anonymous call and a wiretap at the Thorburn house. It wasn't until closer to the summer of 2016 that police received an anonymous call that changed the course of the investigation. The anonymous caller said that the Thorburns were looking for a troubled teenager for a reason. They were driven by a mercantile interest because the custody of troubled children are paid an increased allowance. Anonymous also added that their youngest son, most likely, had an intimate relationship with Tylee, which he himself mentioned in passing before the tragedy. Of course, this information could have been a lie, but detectives remembered that they had already heard the theory that Tylee and her named brother might have had an affair from a high school friend of the deceased. The investigators decided not just to take a closer look at Trent, but to take a hard look at him. The interrogations yielded nothing, because the guy and his family members continued to insist on their non-involvement, claiming that the girl herself ran away and then got into trouble. The family's social media pages were quietly checked, and one of the chat rooms in Trent's profile revealed a curious correspondence. About a month and a half before the tragedy, he wrote to his cousin that he had intimacy with a girl much younger than him, but her name he did not give. Of course, the dialogue on the social network could not become incontrovertible evidence, but it allowed the police to obtain permission to install listening devices in the Torburn house, of course, without their knowledge. Already in the first few days, the wiretaps yielded shocking results. On the recordings, the family members could be heard working out their version of events in detail, so that their stories coincided in the smallest detail. The head of the family taught his household what to say and how to behave, and from the mouth of the mother sounded such phrases as, Dad made this decision to save us. We'll have to live with it. Never, never tell anyone or anything, no matter what happens. Several times Rick threatened his family members, and it was obvious that they were afraid of him because they knew that his father could go from words to action at any moment. There was still not enough direct evidence, but the Thorburn's blue card, which gave them permission to work with children, was almost immediately canceled, so the private kindergarten had to be closed. 
the wiretap soon provided confirmation that the youngest of the brothers had indeed been intimate with Tylee. In fact, it happened regularly for several months, and in October he told his mother that Tylee was showing signs of pregnancy. If this hunch had been confirmed, Trent would have gone straight to jail for having an affair with young Tylee. That's when Julia told her husband everything, and Rick decided to take matters into his own hands. On the day of the tragedy, Julia and her sons went to Brisbane early in the morning, ostensibly on business. It was supposed to serve as an alibi for them, and Rick stayed home with his adopted daughter. When the mother and heirs returned home in the evening, it was already known that the girl was missing, and the head of the family said that he had solved the problem without specifying details. Arrest and Investigation Based on the records obtained, all members of the family decided to re-interview, and the police also decided to search Rick's car, in which he allegedly drove his adopted daughter to school on the day of her disappearance. And then it turned out that the car was sold almost immediately after the tragedy. The vehicle was tracked down, and a detailed inspection of it revealed old washed-out traces of blood in the trunk. DNA analysis revealed that the blood belonged to the murdered Tylee. After that, the last doubts were dispelled, and the Thorburns were taken into custody. They were questioned separately, and Trent was the first to speak. It turned out that he had tricked Tylee into seducing him, telling her about his feelings, promising that they would always be together, and Tylee, in love with him, believed it, and even bragged to her friends at school that she was in a real relationship. But when she got suspicious about the pregnancy, she realized that the foster father could kill her, literally, and began to ask her classmates to take her in, at least for a while. Rick fought back the longest, but under pressure from evidence and testimony from his family members, he confessed to killing his foster daughter, saying he was just trying to protect his family. He had indeed strangled Tylee and afterward disfigured her body, hoping no one would ever identify him. The possibility of DNA testing, Rick somehow didn't think about. When the head of the family was formally charged with first-degree murder, he collapsed and was rushed to the hospital with a heart attack. There, doctors concluded that he had provoked the attack himself by taking a large dose of powerful drugs. They fought for his life for several days so that the perpetrator could stand trial and receive a fair punishment. The trial and sentencing of each of the family members. The investigation and trial was followed by the whole country, because the Tylee Palmer case became one of the loudest and cruelest in the last ten years. Each member of the Thorburn family was found guilty, but their sentences were considered by many to be too lenient. For example, the eldest son, Josh, was sentenced to only three months in prison for perjury and attempting to obfuscate the investigation. The court took into account his sincere remorse and the fact that he was a key witness against his father and younger brother at the trial. Julia Thorburn received a year and a half in prison for perjury and harboring her husband and son. At trial, she admitted that she was very afraid of her spouse and believed that he could also massacre her and her sons. The youngest of the brothers was sentenced to four years in prison, which many considered too lenient the punishment for seducing Tylee, perjury, and obstructing the investigation. In fact, the young man served only a little more than one year, after which he was released early. The head of the family, who dealt with Tylee in the most brutal way, was sentenced to life imprisonment. He himself pleaded guilty to all counts, noting that he was very sorry for what he had done. Rick kept repeating that he was driven by the desire to protect his family, but he himself does not understand how he could go to such a crime. After the final verdict, Tylee's birth mother gave an interview in which she said that none of the punishments for her daughter's killers she would have considered harsh enough, but the day of the verdict marked the end of her fight for justice.